With just over one week until the 2020 NFL season starts, I mean, that is weird to say. The Roto World football crew is here to go through one more draft with you. We've done drafts this summer, but gentlemen, I, I have to say, we haven't done a perfect draft, and that is the goal of today. Patrick Darty, Hayden Winks, and John Daigle will be joining me. So this is what I pitched you. This was the concept. Again, this is our perfect draft. We kind of came to the conclusion of the 107 slot, so that means 206, 307, 406. We will be rotating picks, and we can only select based on relative ADP. We're using underdog fantasy ADP because we think it's the sharpest out there. Hayden Winks, did I basically cover all of the guidelines that I sent to you all? Yeah, except that you're um, talking crap on my L Lamar Jackson Raven stack from July. That was a perfect draft if we go back to that. <laughs> Uh, I'll remind everyone out there that we have months and months of podcasts, so uh, go back and listen to all of those if you haven't. Daigle, what do you think about this concept? I mean, look, we're going to rotate. We're going to build an actual team. Obviously, no one's going to be drafting with us, but selecting based on ADP will give everyone else a, a clear concept of where these guys most likely will rank and which ones we want to reach on. And we're not going to reach too far. Like, whenever it's my turn on the clock, I only looked – five to 10 picks ahead. And that's not in all cases. Sometimes I only look two picks ahead to give to be as accurate as we can possibly be. So I'm excited. It's something new. Let's try it. Let's try it again. In that first and second round, I'm only allowing the guys to select a player about one or two spots ahead in ADP. After that, we'll move to three or four spots ahead in ADP. Hayden Winks, you drew that first pick. Go ahead with pick 107. Who are we taking? Well, there's a lot of movement in the last week or so with all of these running backs. And basically, the top 14 running backs are being drafted within like the first 18 overall picks. We have Alvin Kamara possibly holding out. We have uh, Dalvin Cook possibly holding out. We have Joe Mixon possibly holding out. There's also been some injuries with some of these other guys. So there's one guy that's just kind of been constantly climbing up the draft boards, and that is Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I know there's a lot of well, draft debate. already ruined. Team I know, no I know, I know. Uh, he just seems so safe to me at this point, just because I think that he's by far the best player in the backfield in Kansas City. They dropped him in the first round for a reason, and we saw Damian Williams from Week Nine through the playoffs. He was he was averaging the third most fantasy points among all running backs. And no offense to Damian Williams, I think Clyde edwards hilaire is just a better all around player better in the passing game. And I think that we're kind of underselling his ability to, to run between the top, between the tackles. He's a really stocky guy. And of course you just want to want to have pieces of this offense. So I think that Clyde Edwards Hilaire is going to be a rock solid RB one. Pat, what's your concern here? I mean, we discussed this on the players, the staff disagrees with most on the show right before this one. I'm with Hayden, um, especially with, you know, a complete lack of preseason. The, the news that we're getting is so, interesting from a contract standpoint and from a playing standpoint that as Hayden outlined the Alvin Kamara Dalvin Cook dynamics right now to me is making me even more certain of CEH despite him heading into his first year and here being a top seven pick as a rookie well see it's just weird to hear words like safe and certain again with someone who has been practicing with an NFL team for three weeks and you know has zero live reps of any kind that's still like my biggest hang up there and uh just i've been repeating this over and over again to you guys and to the audience too where i just don't know I, where i wasn't sold on them between the tackles before you know especially now after the non-existent offseason i just don't know if the chiefs are going to force the issue etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. but i mean i of course uh i the, the upside self-evident you you don't need me to lay out the upside either i mean the andy reed the guy who handpicked Brian Westbrook, LaShawn McCoy, Kareem Hunt. I mean, he knows – no one knows running backs better than Andy Reid. And so I'd be a fool to just completely write off the fact that the guy who's handpicked those running backs in the past saw fit to use a first-round pick on Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. And as much as I can get hung up on the quote-unquote red flags or whatever, I mean, at 1-7 too, I mean, you only win – you win drafts with upside, of course, as we all know. And I, I can't – I can't pretend that upside is not just through the roof. It's just off the charts. So even though it's not a pick I'm usually making, uh, I completely understand the logic behind it. 
And if you're not safe with Edward Solaire there, it makes as much sense to go Derrick Henry as well. Um, yeah. If you are infatuated with lubing up with the safety of touches. So Derrick Henry, Clyde Edwards Solaire, uh, they have to be bumped up at least a little bit, especially since a lot of people listening now even um, only play one league. Perhaps they are only drafting their one league this weekend. And so to pass on Mixon, Kamara, uh, Cook, it just makes sense to go ahead and get Henry or Edward Solaire in this spot. That's what makes this exercise so much fun is that Pat might not have made that first round pick, but he is here with our second round pick, the 206, the 18th overall selection, Pat. Um, you know, we've talked all this summer about running back, running back being the strategy, uh, the process that many of us on the show use. You have gone a different route. So as a group, again, the four of us are building this perfect team where you're going in this direction. Yeah, I mean, I'm typically going like running back, wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, or receiver, running back, receiver, receiver. Uh, that's a mouthful. I'm sure everyone listening on a podcast can remember exactly what I just said here. Uh, frankly, if I'm on the clock right now, after I got Edwards Hilaire, I'm like panicking because one of my favorite second round picks is Aaron Jones. But I'm like, do I really want to double up on running back here? Uh, do I want to make everyone mad with like my flag pick of uh, DeAndre Hopkins? Um the perfect yeah, think, draft, Pat. What is the perfect draft? Perfect here? draft. I mean, I guess I'll say DeAndre Hopkins. I'll just say DeAndre Hopkins because, yeah, even with the the concerns that many smart people, many smart people in this chat have with DeAndre Hopkins, it's pretty hard, uh, really, to complain about DeAndre Hopkins in the middle of the second round, isn't it? And yeah, just the reason this he filled such a humongous need for the Cardinals. They went out and aggressively got him. They're a team that wants to make offense easy. It's not like. When it's not like where you come to the Patriots and they throw the world's most complicated playbook at you. And we hear on August 20th, you know, that you're Chad Johnson and, you know, can't pick up the, the concepts or whatever. They want to make life easy on their skill players. They want, they want DeAndre Hopkins for a DeAndre Hopkins role, which is 140, 150 targets. It's an offense that got to pass a lot last year, but they want to pass more this year. Uh, frankly, I mean, deceptively, maybe sometimes the perception this is like a crowded skill core, maybe not. I mean, Larry Fitzgerald basically on his last legs. Christian Kirk, still a lot of upside, but a weird year. He was hurt for a lot of 2019. I just think they aggressively addressed this need. He he's, he's one of the top three or four physical talents still in the league at wide receiver. And I won't overthink DeAndre Hopkins in the second round and just love this upside. So, Hayden, are, oh, go Hayden, ahead. I know you and I, again, have been one of the pieces of this group that have been going running back, running back. But as you alluded to, that running back group has kind of shrunk because I don't know how confident I would be in taking the Camaras and Cooks. So whereas, you know, there are 14 running backs going into the top 20, I'm not sure if I'm fully confident in those running backs anymore. So I am becoming more and more open to going with tight end or wide receiver in round two. And I absolutely love this Ginger Hopkins selection here at the 206, again, 18 overall with an ADP, an underdog of 22. Well, yeah, and all these running backs are kind of being drafted above this spot anyways. Like, I, I've been in drafts where, like, 14 out of the first 15 picks are all running backs. So sometimes you don't even get one of the running backs that you want at this spot. So I think that DeAndre Hopkins is a top five fantasy receiver. There are some glaring question marks just with the um, his contract situation as long with uh, just being in a new offense. But I, I, I'm with Pat. I, I do think that this offense is good enough. DeAndre Hopkins is an elite receiver that they'll make it work. Um, so I'm fine with it in, in the late, mi middle to the late second round. I just got to make a point about DeAndre Hopkins and the changing teams. Sorry to cut you off, John. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we know it's tough for receivers to change teams, but usually the kind of receiver that is changing teams is, so, you know, frontline receivers don't come on the market very often. So usually the kind of receivers who are changing teams are players like Tyrell Williams, like Paul Richardson, players that were allowed to walk because they're good but they're not, you know, they're not like a true frontline type player, players who get overpaid. And I think that's a big reason why we see t receivers with new teams. It's very rare that you have a player at the level of DeAndre Hopkins who is changing. So to me, there's just a huge difference between someone like DeAndre Hopkins trying to pick up Cliff Kingsbury's offense than there is like a Tyrell Williams trying to pick up John Gruden's offense. And that's by no means like a, 
you know, a checkmate to the receiver changing team <laughs> argument. But I, th- I think that kind of does get lost in the conversation sometimes when it comes to receivers changing teams. We've just talked so much about Hopkins the past two months that it's, I know. It, makes, it makes sense to add another 30 minutes on top of it. Um, <laughs> I just want to be clear for everyone, though, since this is the perfect draft, are we saying Hopkins the player in this spot or is Hopkins an analogy to take the best wide receiver in that tier off the top, whomever well, that may be? I'm starting to think that DeAndre Hopkins is kind of in his own tier. You know, I, I, the start of Devonte Adams or Michael Thomas or one and two, and then I guess it's Julio Jones and Tyree Kill in that second tier for me, and then DeAndre Hopkins kind of in that three spot in that three tier by himself because I have him, at least in my brain, ahead of that Chris Godwin, Kenny Galladay, Amari Cooper. Like he's at easily the top of that list and the one that I am most confident in. Daigle. So if DeAndre isn't there, then I wouldn't want to go wide receiver here in the middle of that second round. Again, with the Godwins and Galladay's, I like them all, but they're just so jumbled in that grouping to me that DeAndre would be at the top of that list compared to all of those. I think even among the running backs available in the spot, if Kittle were still here, that's who I would go over Hopkins, but that's really the only name that stands out. I thought strongly about Kittle. Would you guys have cringed if I went Aaron Jones? I I know he's another guy we've kind of differed on, but. um, Not um, cringe, but I just personally have Eckler higher. That's it. hmm. Eckler's my guy in that in that part of the the draft when you're talking about these like uh, potential RB1s. Eckler's my guy, but I've been drafting Travis Kelsey and George Kittle way too much. They better have big, big seasons for me. Yeah. Eckler was a possibility. Even Kelsey Jones and Kittle were all possibilities, Pat, but I, I, I do not disapprove of the pick of DeAndre Hopkins. Again, again, we are building a perfect draft here. And that means John Daigle, you're up next. The 307, the 31st overall selection where you're going after we started running back and wide receiver. This range is for me picking off the top of the next tier of wide receivers. And that, wide receiver five through 17 range is ridiculously stuffed with talent between Amari Cooper, DJ Moore, Mike Evans, Juju, Allen Robinson, the list goes on and on. So what I'm doing then is reaching subjectively to the top and going to my personal wide receiver seven, who I've joined the party recently. I Hmm. moved him up in our rankings uh, just 24 hours ago. And that is Adam Thielen because everything in camp, between Everson Griff's, Griffin not coming back, between the injuries going on, BC Johnson outperforming Justin Jefferson in first team reps, uh, everything to me still tells me that not only will this defense be worse, and not only will they have to throw more than the six fewest pass attempts as they attempted last year, but it all is good for Adam Thielen. It makes it a positive situation for him to potentially lead the league in targets. I don't think he will, but we have to at least discuss that range of outcomes when talking about him. And thus, that's who I'm reaching for in this spot. You know, Dago, I gave you the ability to pick any player outside of that top 28 ADP, you know, gave you a buffer range and going down at least to underdog again, every draft platform is different, but underdog has Adam Thielen with an ADP of 36.5. That's some real conviction. That's some super, Mm -hmm. super strong conviction. Um, I know you outlined it a little bit, but we talked about it. That tier can be so jumbled. It can be people's preferences, but I'm not sure if anyone has, you know, less target competition of all of the ones that we mentioned, maybe other than Allen Robinson, than Adam Thielen. And I understand if you want to side with Adam Thielen's quarterback and Kirk Cousins, while he does have his flaws over whatever Chicago quarterback will be passing the ball. And very quickly, I will say that Thielen also won't go in this range in your home draft, most likely. You can wait till the mid-fourth or fourth-fifth round turn, but I think it's someone everyone should be prioritizing as a potential wide receiver two who really is a wide receiver one. Anyone else would like to comment on Adam Thielen? My fear with Adam Thielen like, is Adam Thielen breaking down, basically. I mean, there's kind of flimsy evidence for that, but... Injuries have become more of a concern. He has under 1,000 yards over his past 18 games. Obviously, that was with ascendant talent. Steph Diggs also in the lineup. But this, you know, kind of he got came out ever since the second half of the 2018 season. He just wasn't the same after his 100-yard streak to begin the 2018 season. We haven't seen, like, the same Adam. He's almost been like an A.J. Green who is actually playing. Um, but my, those are really, I'm just nitpicking still with Adam Thielen. When I've come away with Adam Thielen this summer, uh, I'm feeling very good about it. Cause, because like John, I mean, the road to this massive targets I me, mean, yeah. you know, it's not a complex argument. It's very easy to understand and very plausible. 
Hayden, I have a question for you. I actually joined Chris Sims on his show last week, and I was lucky Look enough you, to be able, I was lucky enough to be able to ask Chris Chris a question on his own podcast, even though I was the guest. Uh, and the question I asked was this: You know, Kirk Cousins has at worst been a t like the number seven overall deep passer in the NFL over the last three or four seasons. Like, oftentimes he's in that top three. Last year, we know he led the league in twenty plus yard touchdowns, and Stefan Diggs was the league leader in twenty plus yard touchdown receptions. I looked at that roster. There is absolutely no one on that roster that can fill that role unless you want to talk about bc johnson complete unknown right so could we see hayden a little bit more of a ceiling and higher average depth of target than we've seen in the past from adam thielen because he's a great athlete could he be the one that possibly sees those big time those big throw opportunities unless gary kubiak just wants to work away from that in his offense now without kevin stefanski I'm with Daigle here. I think there's the volume in general is going to be there. That includes deep targets. Like he is probably the, the Vikings best receiver downfield. I don't think that has a dots is going to go through the roof or anything because they're going to have to rely on him getting open five yards down the field, 10 yards down the field to kind of move the chains as well. But I, I'm with Daigle. I think Allen Robinson and Adam Thielen are kind of uh, set up in similar directions where they're clearly the best receiver on their team and that the targets are going to be there. I think Al Robinson is the better player and that's why I have him six overall, but I have Thielen seventh overall, just because I think both of them have top top five uh, target volume this year. All right. Well, I am on the clock now with the 406, the 42nd overall selection. Uh, the running backs in this area, not good. Not ones I want to invest in here in round four. We've talked about it all summer. We want to stay away from these running backs in rounds four through six because it's Melvin Gordon. It's David Johnson. So there's a lot of quality wide receivers that I can select from. I mean, A.J. Brown has an ADP of 40 overall. Robert Woods, 42 overall. DJ Chark, 46 overall. Some real favorites of this group. But there is one player who I am trying to exit and have been this entire summer with, e even though his ADP is about three spots lower than our draft slot. Way too early for rugs. Way, 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 way too early. <laughs> it is Adam Thielen. Uh, excuse me. It is Terry McLaurin. It is Terry. Twice. I'll double up. That's fine. It is Terry McLaurin because, and especially as our wide receiver three, our fourth round selection, um, who knows? And in some draft slots, I know Hayden, you've written about this in, in our premium products and our season long tools when we can take advantage of the default rankings. Terry McLaurin is listed way too low on some draft platforms, but here he's most likely going to see close to the volume in Washington that DJ Moore saw last year in Carolina. That would be a bump in 42 extra targets. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Terry McLaurin's gonna go to the moon with that many targets. He is the number one focus of that offense. And Scott Turner, I understand that there are running back questions, there are tight end questions. Heck, there might even be quarterback questions. The only non-question on that offense is Terry McLaurin. And to me, he's an easy selection in this early of the draft here in round four. Yeah, if he's there in the fifth round in your home league, just just draft him. It's it's as simple as that. And he is there a lot, just like you said, because the default rankings have Terry McLaurin kind of priced in this wide receiver three range where he was last season. They're not projecting forward enough where we have a new offensive coordinator, a new scheme that's going to be passing the ball more. They're going to be scheming their guys open better than the last year's Washington coaching staff that was just handing the ball into Adrian Peterson's belly and then just trying to get out of there. So I'm with you on Terry McLaurin. I think that there is like top 12 potential here, and he's a rock solid RB2 or wide receiver two. And for us, he's our wide receiver three. For reference, we just launched a Roto World Deathmatch League with the biggest dogs in the industry. And at the third, fourth round turn at the end, I went Terry McLaurin as my wide receiver three in that spot. And I immediately got a vulgar text from Establish the Runs Adam Levitan. <laughs> he also was trying to target the unofficial official player of the Roto World podcast this year. You have to be all in on Terry McLaurin. and your home leagues, you're likely going to get him as a wide receiver three and the fourth, fifth round and you have to consider that stealing. Yeah, John, you took him at 37 overall. I had the 33rd pick, and I was so close to pulling the trigger. Uh, immediate regret that I didn't. I got Juju Smith-Schuster instead, and I guess I like Juju's outlook better still. But, I mean, so that's the thing with us in this draft and Terry McLaurin is 
I think even in home leagues, so Terry McLaurin has been making a late like ADP push. Like it has been coming up very quickly. He's been coming up in a lot of rankings. Lots of the rankings have been hashtag adjusted a lot of places. And he has been coming up in both rankings and ADP as August has come on. And I, I don't think it's going to be an article of faith. Like you can take it for granted. He's going to be there in the fourth round every time anymore. And that would be in, in a, a real world draft. I'm not sure if he would have even fallen to us there. And hmm. he's someone who, for all the re- I mean, I, he is was the only choice for me at this spot, uh, Terry McLaurin, when you took him. So fully on board with the pick. I'm just not sure if that, that's going to last in the real world much longer. One final thought and question, Hayden. Any issue with me taking him over A.J. Brown, Robert Woods, D.J. Chark? We're cool with that? Uh, Robert Woods, I would draft over Terry McLaurin. I think that uh, Robert Woods has like top eight volume. So Robert Woods was Hayden's backup pick for one seven. If C8 right. was already <laughs> gone, so I, I I had like fifteen uh, stats I was looking at this year, and I think Robert Woods was popping on every single one of them. Just like scheme changes and just volume concerns, personnel usage. I think that everything is lining up for a big Robert Woods season. Well, again, we're building the perfect draft, so the pick is Terry McLaurin. I did mention our premium products and our season-long tools. I'm telling you, we have the best deal in fantasy football going over to rotoworld.com slash edge. I mean, you get our draft guide for $10 if you just pay for this month. It's this month, September, so you get your week up until your draft plus three or four extra weeks of in-season content. It's the best deal out there. Again, rotoworld.com slash edge. And if you want to go annually, it's 4 bucks a month, the price of guacamole. Hayden Winks. Use promo code FBPOD10 to get $10 off. Again, that's our draft guide at rotoworld.com slash edge. We are through four picks of this perfect draft. We started Clyde Edwards Lair, 107. DeAndre Hopkins, 206. 307, Adam Thielen. And then the 406 was Terry McLaurin. We are back to Hayden Winks here, the 507, the 55th overall pick, which is Hayden. I was kind of eyeing Raheem Mostert as a like con- contrarian pick, but I'm going to go with a thing I've been doing all season. I've been drafting the receivers in this range because historically they have been producing the most. So I'm going to go with Cortland Sutton here, who I think Ooh. is – is he had basically top 15, top 20 usage down the stretch last season, and him and Drew Locke just seemed that they were, weren't totally on the same page. But I think that he's an alpha, true wide receiver one for his team. And I think that uh, I'm not totally sold on Drew Locke as a talent, but in the fifth round, I think that you're going to have somebody that's going to be seeing eight plus targets most weeks. So as our flex play, this is like incredible value. Well, we're through four wide receivers. I mean, there are four wide receivers already. At some point, we would have to look to other positions. Hey, I'm a little bit surprised. A little bit surprised at the exact same ADP. We didn't fill that tight end spot and go Zach Ertz with all the other injuries at that Eagles wide receiver group. Because once again, it seems like everyone can talk themselves out of Zach Ertz each and every year because of what Philly does in the offseason. Yet he's like Mr. Reliable and will be fed all the targets. I mean, right now, how everything is lining up, it seems like Zach Ertz is going to be the target leader once again for the Eagles. Yeah, I I thought that that would be like cheating because I I think that like I think his ADP is way up. Like he's not exiting the fourth round now in league. So I thought that I just okay. didn't want to go that route just to be disingenuous to our to our listeners. But if if we were going by the basics, yes, Zach Ertz, he's going to be locked into another hundred targets this year. In FFPC tight end premium leagues, Sutton has been falling to the mid six most of the time, and that's where I've been taking him because that's where I deem him valuable. At this point, though, I think I would have gone. Uh, Hollywood Brown over Sutton, or if we wanted a running back, as you've mentioned time and time again on this podcast, Hayden, uh, the Rams run the most amount of plays. They are the fastest offense in the NFL whenever they trail, and we expect them to trail a lot. And so Daryl Henderson's soft tissue injury also has me bumping up Cam Akers and probably taking him in this spot since we have three receivers. But I get just picking off the top of the receiver tier here. Pat, I know you're a big Drew Locke believer. I know. Uh, not, not, don't mischaracterize that. I'm a huge Cortland Sutton believer, who to me okay. is like DeAndre Hopkins, who can have success with any quarterback, you know, physically as physically dominant on the outside as any receiver in the NFL. I do think so. It's weird they didn't not weird they didn't have the chemistry in like the five game cameo last year. Uh, they didn't get a ton of time to build it this summer. But Drew Lock, as we know, the one kind he loves to look down the field. Cortland Sutton can make those plays down the field. So it, it, they are a great. Skills. It's just weird because not just you know the the new crowded skill core after all the draft picks, but 
You got Pat Shermer and you know, Drew Locke, not exactly what you think of as a West Coast skill set. So there's just the weird questions there. But Cortland Sutton has gone from someone who could have been a huge overdraft to definitely in an appropriate ADP range and verging on value. I don't think I'm misquoting you by saying you're a big Drew Locke fan, Pat. I mean, no, you've been big Drew Locke the biggest. Ruder. I'm a big oh, Drew okay. like rooter. Uh, he's the first Mizzou quarterback I actually wanted to succeed. And if, if, not to get into Mizzou psychodrama, but most Mizzou fans had didn't even want Blaine Gabbert to succeed in the NFL. weren't big Blaine Gabbert fans. We want to root for Drew Locke, uh, but we understand. We saw enough Drew Locke starts to understand that just when you think he's figured it out, uh, he's about to throw an interception literally right to a linebacker. So, That's some um, – Low key Chase Daniel shade you just threw as well. Well, Pat. just two. We're realistic. I mean, Mizzou makes you nothing if not realistic, and we knew that Chase Daniel, as much as we loved him, was not going to be succeed as an NFL starter. Given right. the offensive line opt out, the transition to a new offensive coordinator, Drew Lock playing now with all these new pieces trying to integrate themselves into the offense in the first year. Uh, I'm fine being labeled the person just out on Denver's offense as a whole. Ooh. And I'm okay being wrong on that. That's why I lean other players over Sutton in this spot. Well, yeah, despite this concerns, the Broncos offense is a very wise 2020 decision. Interesting. But despite those concerns, guys, this is still a perfect draft. I got to say, we are still on <laughs> the train for a perfect draft, despite only have one running back through the first five rounds. And guess what, Pat? You're up next. Are you going to fix that for us at the 606, the 66th? overall selection so yeah how long how far am i allowed to stray from adp here uh, you can only go to the 63rd selection so maybe a couple players can drop to us the 63 overall adp so raheem mostert at 61 is not uh dropping to us here and, and um, neither is ronald jones at 61 or 62 overall Ron, even rojo's not uh nope well then i'm panicking um uh, i'm doing i did this a lot during the summer i've ended up with devin singletary as my second running back oh, no. in a lot of places that's panicking and, that, that, just, no we can't do this we, no we, we can we are and devin singletary we're getting a little psyched out by too many zach moss uh practice reports and so i'm going devin singletary over jk dobbins because i mean unlike jk dobbins we at least know devin singletary for sure has a role we had a rotor blurb this morning where john harbaugh is promising like a big J.K. Dobbins role, but I mean, J.K. Dobbins has to dislodge Mark Ingram, who executed his 2019 assignment to perfection. So to me, J.K. Dobbins still has something in front of him that he has to overcome. Whereas Devin Singletary, I mean, even if this is going to be like a 60 to 40 committee, I mean, Devin Singletary is going to be the 60. And Zag Moss is a threat on all fronts. He's a threat on the goal line. He's a threat as a pass catcher. I mean, Devin Singletary, we just have a hard time accepting players like Devin Singletary who are kind of – they're like the classic, like whole is greater than the sum of their parts. And that's kind of the running back that Devin Singletary is. But the Bills, you know, were very reluctant to commit to him. It was like an every down back last year, but they, Frank Gore running out of gas, like forced their hand at the end of the season. And he did very well in the role. Um, so Josh, I'm ruining our perfect team and taking Devin Singletary as our second running back right here. Josh, is this still the perfect team? That's I my mean, question. Guys, no. <laughs> Isn't there a law that like you're not allowed to advertise lies? And I've just been advertising this as building and constructing the perfect team, and I'm gonna have to keep saying it too. Just hey, like this pound is a real that point environment. Home. We even experts panic, and we just panicked, and we took Devin Singletary. We're gonna try to work around it, but he's it's also the kind of guy who, kidding aside, Devin Singletary, he could be like a classic like late summer anxiety, like looks really silly like in two or three weeks because this is a run first offense. He is the established running back. Zach Moss, who has been practicing with the Buffalo Bills for three or four weeks. I mean, it would not be – it's not a leap of faith to see maybe the Zach Moss will have a setback and isn't – you know, after lighting up a few practices with some light hitting, isn't ready for, like, this role that is suggested by all the glowing reports. So, um, Hayden, any wise words? I think Devin Singletary has some floor, but I don't see the total upside just because I'm not sure if he's going to get – the goal line touches, but I mean, we're in the middle of the pick 60. So I think a, I, I mean, he has a floor as an RB two. That's kind of where I'm at with them. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, pick was Mostert. the pick was monster, but we weren't, apparently he didn't fall to us, even though everyone lets him fall all the time. Hayden, I'm looking at the rankings now uh, that you can. Raheem get. Mostert has a has an ADP of 60 overall, so he does not fit in these guidelines, Pat, that I sent. I mean, the players who I would have selected Dak Prescott and Stefan Diggs, but I will say once again, this is still, a perfect draft and let's Are move on sure it is it's still the perfect draft okay well we've already taken four receiver we're kind of getting into like positional panic too i mean uh well, so we always tell people not to panic so let's not panic john daigle you're up next the 707 the 79th 
overall selection. I'm allowing you to take an ADP of 76 plus here. So who are you going with? So I want to be clear. I'm not going to cheat here and do this, but I want to let everyone know that uh, given the Jalen Rager news, I believe Deshaun Jackson should be taken in this spot. But that doesn't fit our ADP since ADP has yet to adjust for Deshaun Jackson now becoming a must-start player in week one at least and beyond. So I am going to go with Evan Ingram here. I will fill our tight end, and that's because I still believe Edmund Ingram is part of a big five. Yes, he's a totally different tier from the first four ahead of him uh, after Mark Andrews or Zach Ertz, whoever you have three and four. But I like I still think Evan Ingram is the fifth tight end overall, and it is worrisome that he ran fewer routes, saw fewer targets, and blocked more whenever he came back from injury. But before injury, he was still being used primarily as a receiving threat. There is concern about Jason Garrett's offense as well, but I still believe Evan Ingram here is this pick. Whew. Um, okay, well, this has taken a turn I was not expecting at all, but that's why we are doing this exercise. Who would you have taken? Um, well, one, if you want to take Deshaun Jackson, just to take in Deshaun Jackson here. Um, look, you had, 70, you, well, you had 76 plus. I, I mean, I, I like the floor, Julian Edelman. I, we were having this conversation in Slack last night. Deontay Johnson, I'm interested in. I understand this is, an in, this is a difficult spot to be in, um, especially with Jalen Rager no longer being technically on the board here, basically. Hayden, who are we forgetting here? I think Evan Ingram's a, a rock-solid pick here. I, nice. I'm with Bagel. I, I think that – I don't think there's a top five. I think there's a top, top six or top seven. I'll throw in Darren Waller and most definitely Tyler Higby into this, this tier after Zach Ertz and Mark Andrews, but I think that these tight ends are actually okay where we're being drafted. All like the top uh, 30 running backs are off the board. All the guys that you want to be starting in your flex at receiver off the board. This is when you are okay with taking these tight ends that are have a high bust rate historically, like this range of tight ends, but who are we taking over? We can't even decide which running back or receiver we want here. That's why I would chase an upside with an Evan Ingram if he's healthy or a Tyler Higby, who I think has a higher upside with just his role. Just as a group, let's just be thankful that there wasn't a Tevin Coleman guy here and that we didn't <laughs> come away with Tevin Coleman. So maybe we don't think the Ingram pick is perfect, but it wasn't Tevin Coleman, and that's what yeah. we really need to focus Deshaun on. Deshaun Jackson, though, you're right, Josh. Like I just thought it was cheating here, but this is where everyone should be drafting if they're drafting this weekend, Deshaun Jackson in this spot. Okay, I will go next. Um, you know I've been saying this name all summer, and I have the 806, the 90th overall selection and so i'm going to move down a couple spots from that 90th overall pick i'm going to go with henry ruggs with an adp of 92 he is our wide receiver five which is simply amazing to me because i think henry ruggs is going to lead his team in targets this year we've talked really? about it i, really I truly do get more targets than darren waller you yes. really believe that I, I i truly do i i think that this interpretation and it was post-draft and pre-draft. And it was just, you know, how he's outlined by those of us in the draft community, in the football community, that Henry Ruggs is fast, so therefore he's a vertical playmaker. He's so much more than that. And I absolutely believe that John Gruden views him as his Tyreek Hill, as his player that he is going to allow to win in the short to intermediate area, manufacture touches, because where Henry Ruggs was most dominant in college was his speed after the catch. Manufactured touches, question mark? Yeah, no, I mean, it was it was the speed. It was the speed after the catch. The reason he didn't have to break a lot of tackles is because guys couldn't get one or two yards around him. And so just this type of player, and that's why he fits with Derek Carr into those primary receiver targets. And again, this team needs explosion. It needs playmakers. And Henry Ruggs checks all those boxes to me. My favorite with Henry Ruggs is a college player. who I, I'm afraid he's going to be a manufactured touch guy as a rookie. And a college player who never even had 800 yards receiving. I just, I have very serious questions. I had very serious questions about Henry Ruggs as the number 12 overall pick. And I have serious questions about Henry Ruggs as like a mid round uh, fantasy mm -hmm. selection. I'm not on the same train as you are, Josh. And if I ruin the team with Singletary, uh, I would say now you're uh, doing your part. Well, but even if, even if he is like the third target getter on the Raiders, Pat, he's our wide receiver five. You know, so I, I wouldn't say ever that this pick in the middle of the eighth round is going to ruin a fantasy team. And I think the ceiling for Henry Ruggs is is absolutely incredible with his skill set, and which I think the 
the Las Vegas Raiders are going to use him. And it's just a projection. I mean, this is absolutely the type of player that with preseason games and with preseason usage, we would have had a lot more information. But he's this is just one of those profiles that I'm believing in this summer while a lot of people hopefully are fading him like you are. Hayden and I are just laughing at the parents fighting at the table this entire time. <laughs> well, Derek Carr Listen is very famous Vicar. for unlocking weapons. So yeah. I'm I'm indifferent. I believe in our rankings. I'm the lowest on him, but I don't have a take either way. Like it's fine. I don't I don't care. So I'll pass it to Hayden because I know Hayden is also high on him. Well, if we're talking about Derek Carr and he's been reserved his entire passing career. He needs a guy that's going to get open. He doesn't like throwing into contested catch situations. Henry Ruggs gets open underneath. That's what happens when you're a 4-3 receiver that can get in and out of his breaks, like what we saw with Henry Ruggs in Alabama. And I'm so uh, like just excited for uh, somebody with this type of playmaking ability in a John Gruden offense that lacks true playmakers outside of Josh Jacobs and then to an extent Darren Waller. I think that he's clearly the best receiver on the team, and the uh, Raiders have the hardest schedule in the league from a passing perspective. I think they're going to be trailing so much. They're going to have to pass the ball a lot. I think that Henry Ruggs is going to end up being a weekly flex play in the later half of the year. I'm quietly loving all of the Brian Edwards buzz, too, that like people are – I'm not going to say forgetting Henry Ruggs, but it seems like they believe that they're like equal in terms of the pecking order. I would be stunned if that's we're, the case. Stunned. We're if putting that's the a case. lot of faith and trusting that Derek Carr is the kind of quarterback who will lock on to Henry Ruggs instead of Hunter Renfro. Let's just put it that way. We're, we're talking about a five-star Alabama recruit, like who the, never had 800 say, yards in a season. I mean, why? Yeah, but, why was he not? But, like, why does he need touches manufactured for him if he's such because, a? He, he, he doesn't need that manufactured to him. I just think that a team can use him in that way if they are struggling to get and him. They the will football. be using him that way as a rookie, which to me is a major red flag in fantasy. 800 yards, he didn't play any fourth quarters because Alabama was up 65 to four. And, and to still be with two other NFL receivers also matters. Like the fact he they, produced they what he did, numbers. Henry with two Ruggs other didn't. elite receivers on the team. It's yeah. Henry Ruggs is good. That's not everything. Henry Ruggs is very good. Very good. All right, let's move on to the ninth round selection. This is the 907, uh, the 103rd pick. Hayden Winks, you're on the clock. Well, let's just round it out. This can be quick. I was going to take Deshaun Jackson here. Um, and I think this we are getting very wide receiver heavy, but I think that Deshaun Jackson provides a ton of value. I think that we'll be able to start him in our flex a lot. And just to recap the, the recent news, uh, Jalen Rager is probably going to be missing a couple weeks in the season. And even when he does come back, he's going to be playing in a brace. His catch radius is going to be affected. There's also a high re-injury rate. We still don't know anything about Alshon Jeffrey here. So I think there's one constant in the – that's going to be Deshaun Jackson featured in these 12 uh, personnel sets with two tight ends on the field. You'll have Dallas Goddard, who's now more intriguing as a late guy, and Zach Ertz underneath, and then Deshaun Jackson winning anything beyond 15 yards downfield. So I think spike weeks are coming, and I think that Carson Wentz, uh, by default, has to be trusting Deshaun Jackson uh, more so than Greg Ward and J.J. Arcega Whiteside. I'm curious to get your take on this, Josh, because, yes, we all agree with Sean Jackson. That's fine. But as for Jalen Rager, we were both very high on him. And mm -hmm. when I was recently adjusting rankings in your 12-team, 16-round leagues redraft, I don't think he's draftable anymore, like at all. Interesting. I, I'm still taking him on my team. I still want him on my Same team. ADP and, or allowing him to fall? No, 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 no. Allowing him to fall a little bit. Okay. Now, that, that that's the unknown, right? Like, we've been drafting for months with basically the same ADPs for so many of these players. Mm -hmm. And so often in this 8, 9, or 9, 10, depending on the draft platform, I've been going Ruggs, Rager in back-to-back -back, um, rounds. Now, that's not going to happen now. And, and maybe I take a risk and let him fall another three or four rounds. But when you get to that point, when you're just drafting players, and we need to always think about this. We always think our drafts are perfect when we exit. This one is, I mean others. But that those players are going to be dropped in a couple weeks, right? For ones yeah. who outperform, there are other draft slots or, or ones who aren't on roster, so on and so forth. And I, I still want Jalen Rager. And if he's out, then you can move him to IR spots. And there's going to be more of those this year in your fantasy leagues as well. Not having to have surgery, which correct me if I'm wrong, that is the news. I think that is important. Again, he is going to have to wear a harness and a brace and all that kind of stuff. But I still believe that they believe the Eagles, that Jalen Rager is a key to their offense this year. So maybe they can get by with Deshaun Jackson, which I'm so glad we have because he's one of my favorites this summer too. But I still want both. I absolutely still want both exiting my drafts. Fair. Real bummer. I have Jalen Rager on basically every team, and I'm a little uncertain on what to do. Just because 
Whereas Debo Samuel now apparently seems like he'll be ready for week one. It does seem like Rager is going to miss at least a game. And just being a rookie who, you know, again, just by virtue of it being 2020 was already behind because of the no practice, no conditioning, and now having a shoulder, which we know is a huge aggravation risk. Uh, Rager does have a lot of risk. Uh, I still love the talent. And like so I talk about teams aggressively addressing needs uh, like the Cardinals and Hopkins. I mean, the Eagles very aggressively addressed their glaring need with Jalen Rager. So we know they believe in him. We know they want that big role right off the bat. But just why did it have to be a shoulder injury? Why did it have to be so close to week one? It's yeah. a very tough situation. All right. Here is our team so far through nine rounds. Claude edwards Solaire, DeAndre Hopkins, Adam Thielen, Terry McLaurin, Cortland Sutton, Devin Singletary, Evan Ingram, Henry Ruggs, and Deshaun Jackson. I love that wide receiver balance. And obviously we would. We have six wide receivers already through nine rounds, two running backs, and one tight end. John Daigle, we're turning to you at the 10. Oh, actually, is this Pat or is this Daigle? Did I screw up the order? I'm 1006. I you screwed right? up the order, but it's oh, okay. it's right. It is Daigle. I apologize. John Daigle, you're up. 1006, 114 overall. Who are we taking? We need another running back here. Uh, Badly. So, oh, man. Y'all are going <laughs> to yell at me so much. Uh, Chase Edmonds, Alexander Madison. I mean, that that's the it's area. It's going to be better than that for. with that kind of pressure. So, so to be clear, Carryon Johnson does not qualify here, right? Correct, because Carryon Johnson has a 105 ADP on the so right dog. before. Okay. I, I, um, I'm, allow, I'm allowing 110 and up. Okay, no problem. Um, in that case, I will go Chase Edmonds, who I know Hayden Winks is his highest exposure on Yahoo Draft and Best Ball is to Chase Edmonds. Um, this team genuinely doesn't need chase Edmonds. We need touches in week one. Uh, I am concerned about <laughs> Devin Singletary. So that's why if Karyon Johnson fell, I would go that route or just a running back we can get touches from. But at least in this case, uh, there is a potential path, although I don't think it happens immediately for Edmonds to work at least somewhat behind Kenyon Drake. But the real message here is his handcuff potential as a clear-cut RB1 if Kenyon Drake goes down, if this foot precautionary foot injury reportedly lingers into the regular season. So I'm fine taking Chase Edmonds here. Can, can I make a pitch, Daigle? Down Please. At, at the 120 ADP is Damian Harris. I think Damian Harris is much more in line for week one touches than Chase Edmonds is. I agree with this, but also Sonny Michelle coming back and just being used in practice now, like we know he's not going to miss games most likely on any pup list. So he's going to be around. That doesn't mean he plays ahead of Damian Harris, but that means he's at least around. So I'm starting to get slightly concerned on Harris in the 10th round. I agree with that. The The whole thing is uh, we, we talk about Shanahan and some of these, some of these other rushing offenses. Cliff Kingsbury's rushing offense is legit. Like that's a top three unit. The, just the way that they're set up, especially with Kyler Murray as a threat off the edge. These linebackers, defensive ends, have no idea where the ball is going whenever Kenyon Drake and Chase Edmonds get the ball. So I'm, I'm just want to be betting on this rushing offense really coming through. And if that's an ankle injury away, or we, we're already seeing Kenyon Drake with a foot injury. So I think that Chase Edmonds, I don't think he'll have a ton of standalone value, but I think he'll have some standalone value. But he's definitely, I think, probably the best or the second best pure insurance back in fantasy. Yeah, the Cardinals were probably the second most sophisticated rushing offense in the NFL last year after the 49ers. So, um, a second Hayden's point. Card Cardinals backups averaged in totality 3.1 touches per game in the eight games Kenyon Drake came over and started for them. Hayden, do you think that Chase Edmonds outperforms that mark this year, having potential standalone value? Well, I, I would be thinking about like more spiked weeks, like in a best ball format, where like I think that you're not going to be ever comfortable starting. Chase Edmonds in a flex spot in like a redraft league. But I think that there is going to be some weeks where he just breaks off a long touchdown. I mean, he's he's got plenty of athleticism. And the way that the rushing offense is set up, that they are more prone to an outside run where they're just going down 50 yards downfield. I think that Chase Edmonds might have a few of those this year. Okay. Despite these disagreements that we might be having, this is still the perfect draft, gentlemen. <laughs> it let's is. Con let's continue it on with the 1107 selection, number 127 overall. Patrick, who are we selecting? So I'm not allowed to stray for Damian Harris because I was going to try to balance out yeah, the lack of week one certainty with Chase Edmonds with some week one touches and uh, Damian Harris, but so that's not allowed, correct? Correct, um, because he has an ADP of 120 and the buffer I am giving you from pick 127 is all the way up to 123. Well, I'm just basically opting out of this pick, um, except <laughs> for uh, I'll do, uh, you know, so we've all 
got different approaches of receiver. I'll have different guys, a receiver that we seem to really like. But, I mean, we're probably all happy with Preston Williams, are we not? Uh, we need running backs, though, on this we perfect We need running team. backs, but, I mean, I'm not forcing this year with Duke Johnson or, I mean, Keyshawn Vaughn, who's going to be like a kick returner. Um, I mean, Sony Michelle is out there. But I, I'm just totally – uh, I'm just fading running back at this point. I'm going Preston Williams. We're going all in and receiver. A guy who apparently made a complete recovery from his torn ACL. Um, we know is having a special rookie season as an undrafted free agent. Who wouldn't have gone undrafted if not for off the field issues uh, before tearing his ACL last year? Uh, a pretty narrow target tree for the Dolphins. It's really just Devontae Parker, Preston Williams, and Mike Jacecki. And at this part of the board, uh, we're going to be, he's just a rare, rare combination of size and speed and athleticism and Preston Williams. And I'm very, very happy to get him at this part of the board. Would you have felt better, Pat, about going quarterback here like Cam Newton? Because that's a possibility too. We don't have a quarterback yet. I thought about Cam, well, we don't have a quarterback. And like, since this is uh, not a real draft with other experts where there would normally still be basically every quarterback available here, that is becoming kind of an alarming concern for our team. But frankly, it's a game of quarterback chicken, and I didn't be, want to be the one to do it. I don't want to appear weak uh, in front of my colleagues, so that's I why you. I didn't take a quarterback. Um, yeah, Preston Williams is fine. I know, Hayden, you really like Sammy Watkins still in this spot. I know, you know, especially early on in the summer, Miko Harden was kind of a darling of the fantasy football industry, but all the reports and the blurbs that we are reading over at rotoworld.com indicate that Sammy Watkins is still locked into that number two quote unquote wide receiver role with the chiefs. Just don't forget August is the month of Tevin Coleman and Sammy Watkins. This is when they shine. So, <laughs> um. Yeah. I, 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 I was, I was expecting this, that this is how they were being utilized in the playoffs last year. And the, the entire receiving group comes back. So I don't know what, why we would expect to change outside of McCole Hardman being kind of in this number three role when he was in the number four role behind Demarcus Robinson. I think those two flip. I think McCole uh, Hardman is more like a, a pure handcuff, um, which is kind of uh, interesting for a receiver. But um, I think I'll just take my my chances with Sammy Watkins in like the 12th or thir 13th round instead. But um, obviously McCole Hardman could pay off in a big way if, if Tyreek Hill um, rolls an ankle. All right, we are here in now the 12th round, 1206, 138 overall. Um, when preparing for this perfect draft that is still perfect, I only have tight ends written down at this point because I wasn't expecting us to select tight ends until now. The names of Johnu Smith, Austin Hooper, Chris Herndon. We need a quarterback, and it stinks because none of these quarterbacks, I would say, are ones that I'm constantly leaving drafts with. I mean, in this area, you have Aaron Jones, you have Daniel Jones, or excuse me, Aaron Rodgers, Daniel Jones. Um, you know, I'm, I'm leaving a lot with Ben Brothersberger, but that's not really the type that it seems like the rest of this group is going with. But it doesn't matter what you guys think. It matters what I think. So we are going with Ben Roethlisberger as our next selection. And look, if it doesn't work out, if you see in week one or week two that his arm just is not what it used to be and this team doesn't hit the ground running, which really they should be, if Ben Roethlisberger is healthy, then guess what? Quarterback has never been deeper, and you can pivot off to it. But what we do get here with Ben Roethlisberger in our 12th round selection is a quarterback that when he was healthy the last time he played, he was the quarterback two overall in fantasy football. I understand that this is not with Antonio Brown any longer, but I still think the Steelers, one, can evaluate skill position players in terms of pass catchers, and two, have set Ben Brothersberger up for success. A great defense, a good offensive line, players like Juju Smith-Schuster, Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, James Washington, Eric Ebron, James Conner, so on and so forth. So as our quarterback one, and again, that can change by the time week two or week three rolls around, but we're aiming for the moon here. We're going with Ben Brothersberger with our selection. This team didn't need a quarterback. It needed Chris Herndon is what it needed. But uh, uh, I don't know if we needed Chris Herndon. We need running backs. <laughs> we still need running backs. I got you. Running I got you. My next sacrifice, <laughs> guys. I mean, running back, like that ship sailed. And you know what? We're out in the middle of the Atlantic now. And if you want a running back, you can turn around, go back to America. But I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to take our tight end, too, when we don't have a quarterback one yet, Pat. So I understand, I, yeah. I, 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 I would much rather take Ben Roethlisberger here. I understand I'm kind of, speaking of ship sailing, I'm kind of on an island here, Hayden. Why are you so down? And if you are down, I'm Ben Roethlisberger in comparison to me. 
Well, this is fine. I'm not going to like hate on Big Ben this late in the draft. I think that there is some real injury risk here, but we're in a redraft league where if he gets injured, so what? And then we'll just go pick up Joe Burrow, who's going to outscore him anyways off the waiver wire. So uh, any of these quarterbacks in this range, I'm fine with. We needed one. Uh, I got you guys with a with a running back with our next pick, though. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go to our next pick then. Uh, now I'm going to advertise this as a as a quote unquote perfect draft uh, at 1307. <laughs> 1307, 151 overall. Hayden Winks, who are we going with? All right, Josh, I need you to close your eyes and not pay attention to ADP here because we are going to be drafting AJ Dillon. We are getting our one cheat pick, and AJ Dillon's going to be our guy. I think that he's going to have um, a chance to compete for the goal line role. And this is a team that had like 16 rushing touchdowns last year. I still think Aaron Jones is going to be the primary guy down down uh down near the goal line but aj Dillon is 247 pounds he has the biggest legs in the nfl and i think that there's a chance <laughs> if aj uh or if aaron jones got hurt that aj Dillon would go into like a really strong two down roll where he could be running between the tackles all the way down to the goal line and then plummet into the end zone so i think that he's a a pretty strong um insurance type and then he's kind of like the last of this group where i feel comfortable actually rostering him um, and just giving it a couple of weeks to see what his role is with Aaron Jones. 21 collegiate cl catches across three seasons certainly limits his upside, but there is still an outside shot. And I think it's 50 50. I don't think it will happen, but there's an outside shot that Jamal Williams does not make it past Saturday's final cuts. And if that's the case, AJ Dillon walks into a, a singular role right behind Aaron Jones. And so that's what we're hoping for with this pick. When it comes to the goal line, so. Obviously, we all accept there will be Aaron Jones touchdown regression, but I just why would it be because the Packers decide to not use him as their goal line back, a guy who just very easily scored 16 touchdowns during the last year? Like, why make the change? I just I don't really understand. Well, like, let, why let me ask this: like, why would this be happening? Is well, what I, why uh, why would they take AJ Dillon in the second round? I mean, because there there would be a two back offense. I think it's, I lean more towards John's interpretation, or their Jamal Williams. They're moving on from, and yeah. he's going to be the new one B back to the one A, um, and he's going to get goal line carries. But I mean, I don't think Aaron Jones is like uh, the status as the primary goal line back is under any threat whatsoever. I, yeah, I, I think that's just you know the potential, the the possibility of it. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that Hayden or any of us are saying like this is definitely happening because, like you said, Pat, and like you've been consistent about. You know, we all, I would say, have undervalued Aaron Jones at points this summer where already undervaluing him has been put into his value at the end or middle of a second round selection. I, You know, it's so difficult. Again, this is one of those players, and especially with rookies, so difficult to know, one, how good he is as a professional, two, what the role is going to be. Like if he played a certain amount of snaps or in certain situations when the Packers' ones were on the field during preseason, we would have a much better idea of it. But at this point in the draft, and one Hayden, I will allow it, um, I, I absolutely do like A.J. Dillon here, not as our running back four necessarily, but adding him to our running back group, I will say. And yeah. I have no idea, no problem with throwing him on the squad. Uh, right. So. Right. I will say that th there is a chance. I mean, he's 247 pounds. Like at mm -hmm. Boston College, this is what he did. Like they dr they certainly think that he's a good short yardage back, and he's 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 not 200 247 pounds. And like Eddie Lacy, like we're talking about like 247 pounds, like really big and strong with like four or five speed, like at 247 pounds. Derrick like, Henry, like yes, like Derrick Henry, and I mean it's kind of hilarious to me that when Matt LaFleur was with the Tennessee Titans and Derrick Henry, that instead he used Deion Lewis. And now when he's with the Packers, in, instead of you know keeping a, a smaller back, he wants to go find his version of Derrick Henry that he didn't even use. Like, it's just, I don't know what that means, if that means anything, if we're just trying to connect dots. Uh, just a little mysterious, one mystery ahead of the 2020 season. And to be clear, Williams being released would open a larger door because I still believe A.J. Dillon will have a role. It will just be minuscule touches unless he can force himself into a good situation um, if Williams stays on the roster. I think all three in that case would have touches, which would be a disaster. All right, two more selections. At least we have every single position filled. We still just have four running backs. We have one tight end and one quarterback. Pat, this is up to you. At the 1406, 162 overall. I'll let you go up to 158, 157 if you want to, um, but pick anyone from there on after. 
Uh, well, I'm thinking about canceling myself then if I'm allowed to go up to 158 because uh, I'm putting I'm putting Adrian Peterson on the squad. And uh, we need what is some, this team? We need some week one touches. Uh, and uh, so you know, Antonio Gibson, special potentially special player, explosive player. Uh, to me, the way I keep viewing the situation, it is hard enough to integrate an offensive weapon into the offense in a normal season. I just think it's going to be even harder in the year where they've had a month of practice. And I just think undead zombie Adrian Peterson is still going to be like 12 to 15 carries for at least for like the month of September. And maybe he'll end up being one of our first drops uh, if our team is relatively healthy and we don't really have to drop anyone until around bye weeks. But I will take uh, Adrian Peterson in what is probably guaranteed carries uh, early in the season at the with one of our final two picks. I feel like the stress and excitement of another kid coming within the next seven days has aged you 30 years. Like, I feel like that's what's happening here. I mean, we're, we're, this is the sharpest ADP, right? And he's, I took him at his ADP. So it's not exactly like I'm uh, you know, coming out of this from left field. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, too, uh, you get older, you understand that it's not all about the shiny rookies. It's not all about the right. offensive weapons. And maybe I'm finally making my transition to being a, a veteran value uh, drafter. I God, I hope not. But uh, <laughs> just put me in the ground then when that truly happens. But uh, yeah, maybe that's what's subtly happening. Hayden, you've probably completed 75 drafts, if not more than that, this summer. Is this your first selection of Adrian Peterson? Yes, it is. Uh, nice. Like, like yes, but. I mean, I, I kind of do think that like Adrian Peterson is going to get like 12 carries and all the goal line work where like maybe he has a couple top 24 weeks. I don't think that there's much of a ceiling here, but I do think that the Washington offense in general by default has to get better a little bit. If you look at historically, when you're talking about a team that was like by far the worst offense in the league, usually they make like a pretty noticeable uh uh, step up even if they're like ranked the 28th best offense in the league that that gap is kind of underappreciated so uh, that's why i think we're on Ant antonio gibson and terry mclaurin but adrian peterson the 15th i guess why not yeah let's be All clear right. non-existent ceiling had we not gone rothsberger i would have loved to still come away with garoppolo as well i think that was the quarterback pick we should have waited on in this range but again this is the quote-unquote perfect team so here we go well, here we go, John Daigle. You're going to close us out here with the 1507, 175 overall. I'll let you go up to 170, 171. Um, who are you going to exit and close out this draft for us with? We need touches. And so I am going to Joshua Kelly to finish this out. I don't mind Stevenson's or Kendrick Bourne if you need a wide receiver, but we clearly don't. Uh, it was Justin Jackson initially working with the first team. And remember, Justin Jackson averaged eight touches per game in the first three games last year when Melvin Gordon was still holding out. But Justin Jackson's injury in camp the past week has allowed Joshua Kelly to not only take those reps behind Eckler, but reportedly shine. And so it does look like he will open the year in that perhaps eight to 10 touch role ahead of Justin Jackson. And I think we need to covet those touches right now. All right. Um, I think we've forgotten. We haven't talked about it at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this Jaguars running back situation is completely in flux. And that was a touch department that we did not even factor into this equation needing touches at the at start of week one. Chris Thompson is available with this ADP. We could go Divino Zigbo in this area as well. I mean, Ryquell is starting to to rock it up uh, a little bit, but he hasn't, you know, been practicing, it feels like for weeks now. Daigle, is is that would we rather go in that direction rather than a backup here? Sure. Um, would you rather go Chris Thompson or Devon Zigbo? I know your answer, but go ahead. No, let's go Chris Thompson. Let's go Chris really? Thompson because, I mean, I, I, as much as I love Devon Zigbo, I've also drafted a lot of Reichel Armstead this summer because I was completely avoiding and fading Leonard Fournette at his ADP and even after his ADP. And, you know, I they obviously, the front office, the coaching staff likes Reichel Armstead to some degree because he was the one that got playing time above Devon Zigbo last season. I, I don't know if that's as clear cut as someone like Chris Thompson's role is. And we know with Jay Gruden calling plays that basically Chris Thompson is a Gruden as well. And so he's going to have a role in this offense from week one. And as long as he can stay healthy, we know he has a role opening. I think you put it best. We did the rap rapid reaction video on our Roto world Twitter account yesterday. And then you said afterwards that Chris Thompson does have the role, but how long? And that's kind of the question. So I think you're right. Uh, we need the week one touches. So sure. Let's go Chris Thompson. 
Cool. Hayden, what do you think? I think Jacksonville is going to pass the ball a lot more than they did last year. I think they were like 22nd in neutral pass rate. I think that's going to go up significantly. They're going to want to see if there's anything uh, going on with Gardner Minshew, and I think that they don't have any strong running back talent on the team. I watched Mike Will Armstead last night. was not impressed. I watched Divine Azigbo. I was slightly more impressed, but but not – I mean, not, not completely sold by any measure. I think that Chris Thompson is going to walk into like probably a decent amount of targets where he could have a, a couple top 24 weeks in PPR leagues. Um, the upside, of course, as a one dimensional back that's always injured. Um, we don't have to talk about it. Yeah. Well, let's outline this perfect draft that we just completed, Patrick Darty. What do you think? Um, starting off, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, then DeAndre Hopkins, Adam Thielen, Terry McLaurin, Cortland Sutton, Devin Singletary, Evan Ingram. Henry Ruggs, Deshaun Jackson, Chase Edmonds, Preston Williams, Ben Roethlisberger, and closing out with three backs and A.J. Dillon, Adrian Peterson, and Chris Thompson. Pat, I will definitively say that in this league, we have the best wide receiver group of them all, 100%. Yeah, we've got a lot of overall upside, and we've got a lot of running backs we're going to cut probably fairly quickly. I would have preferred a different quarterback, um, but – the upside we have at receiver, uh, especially, um, and, you know, in the upside too at running back with CEH, I mean, I focus on the downside, but we have league winning upside with our first running back. Um, so that's still, that's the most important thing we know. Come out of your draft with the most upside of anyone in your league. Uh, we protected ourselves for early in the season of some of our upside plays get off to slow starts with some guaranteed touches. And yeah, that we came out uh, with a very, very, very strong overall squad. Having said that, I can still be concerned when the graphics team pushes this team out. I'm concerned about the mention still. <laughs> of which one they're going to select. They're not, they're not going to. They're not going to be a fan of the Devin Singletary graphic. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to be a fan. So we got to be. We got to be strong, though. You know, when you have an opinion on every player, you put them out there. You're going to get tomatoes thrown at you. It's going to happen. Everyone listening, it is important to take away the discussions we had at these draft picks. Uh, take away big picture thoughts. I'll say that. It's so funny because we spend months and months trying to come to a much better decision with information and agreement here, Hayden. I would say that this podcast included the most disagreement in a draft or in a single show that we've had all summer. And it, that's to me just incredible that we have about a week and a half left until week one. And now we're here with all the disagreement. That's pretty impressive considering we had a podcast literally titled Players We Disagree on the Most. <laughs> and then we just we just outdid that. So uh could we get some uh, NFL games on? I'm 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 kind of over yeah. talking about all these guys and disagreeing oh, yes. with everybody. Give me some tape. We're getting so little new information to like change minds that like everyone's just like more entrenched than ever. Yeah, we uh need some games. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been our perfect construction of a fantasy football team ahead of 2020. And I will hear no disagreements about that. I will point you back to our previous shows. Again, they will help you win your fantasy draft, your fantasy weeks. If you go back and listen, and I want to shout out once again, our premium products, rotoworld.com slash edge. It's $10 just for this month of September to go and help you uh, have all the information you need to have a successful draft. And then for three or four weeks after that, with our season long tools, rotoworld.com slash edge and $10 off using promo code FBPOD10. For Hayden, for Daigle, for Pat, I'm Josh, up the villa. Talk to y'all soon. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.